Valley Group, and I'm we're all uh, both uh, all of us from the Chippewa Valley Group are, are, are pleased to welcome those of you who've come from afar. We're pleased, appreciative of that, appreciative of the fact that you came a great distance to uh, to to take part in our program. Um, I want to remind everybody a few things that I'm sure you've all done thousands of Zoom calls so far, but just in case there's one of you who hasn't lately. Um, Try to mute yourself during the program. Make sure that you're muted so that when the lawnmower goes off behind you or the snowblower, depending on whether you're in the north or the south, um, it doesn't uh, interrupt the speaker. Um, uh, you open your chat window if you know where that is. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen. On mine, it's down here and it says chat. If you open that up, it will show you messages. There's some, there'll be links there that. Uh, will help you um, be able to follow up on what you're, you might hear and see tonight. Um, the meeting is going to be recorded. And so uh, you may have a chance to see it again, or if you have to leave early, you may get a chance to see it, the balance of it later on. Um, we will let you know about that when, when, uh, when the time comes after the meeting, tomorrow and the next day or so. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, first of all introduce. First, I want to introduce uh, Jadine Sonoda, who is who's uh, done great uh, service to us. Uh, she's with the Sierra Club staff in Madison, and she's uh, helping us out tonight. Um, Jadine, hi everybody. Um, and then uh, I also want to um, introduce Karen Triber, who is our Chippewa Valley Group Chair. Karen, you want to say hello? Yeah. Hello, welcome everybody. And I want to say that it's Richard Smith. I don't know if you said your name, that's uh, also running this program. He's our technical genius. And one of the founding uh, members, and I think it was 1983, our Chippewa Valley group started. And we were all young then. <laughs> and, uh, but we're, we're limping along, keeping the group growing. And this is our second Zoom meeting and we're excited about it. And um, there'll be links in the chat. And also uh, this year I've gotten involved with the state, um, the Wisconsin Sierra Club chapter. And if you go on their website or their Facebook page, there's all kinds of opportunities to volunteer with them. All these action teams and we're kind of inactive because, but they're keeping going. So I'd encourage all of you people to join them. It's, it's a good way to stay active. And um, so Jeff Henry produced this, but he can't be here because he's got family to help with tonight. But so I'll, I'm with the show. You, you take it, Richard. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight, our presenters, um, two, two people involved in tonight's presentation, Michael Tabaris and David Trimner. Michael is director of Clearwater Farms program at the River Alliance of Wisconsin. He has many years of research and practice experience in water management policy and agricultural water development. He's a non-resident fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and lectures on water policy topics at the University of Wisconsin, Madison's Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. That's one thing. And the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. That's another thing. And um, that, thank you, uh, Michael. The, uh, I'll go ahead with David's introduction. He is the general manager at Miltrum Farms. Miltrum uh, Farms is a 2800 uh, cow family owned dairy farm along with 5,000 acres of cropland. The team at Miltrum Farm strives to produce a high quality and nutritious product while focusing on water stewardship and land conservation in its operations. Before they start, I would like to ask you to write questions that you might have for the speakers as the, as the program goes on, things that pop into your mind put them in the chat. When we're done, when they're done, we're going to ask them some questions. So hopefully you will have come up with some great ones to do that, but add them to the chat. If you haven't done that yet, open the chat window at the bottom of your screen and, um, and enter those questions over there. There'll be a great prize for the person with the best question. So uh, Michael, are you kicking it off? Thanks, it's over to you. 
Thanks. Yeah, I'll start because I, I know you're really here to see David. So I want to make sure that uh, I, I set him up and that he gets a good good chance to talk to you all. Um, it, it th thanks for inviting us here. I really appreciate the time and um, everybody's participation. It's, it's, uh, we're we're kind of getting used to the Zoom thing, but I got to tell you, it's one of the nice things about it is it's letting me talk to more groups of people more rapidly than I normally would. And so that's, that's a real pleasure. Um, so th thanks for the thanks for the interest and and um, I hope hope you find this useful. So uh, I, I thought what I would do is I'll get a little slideshow and I will tell you a little bit about uh, River Alliance and then a little bit about our program uh, and and what's driving it and its elements and then I'll I'll let uh, David tell you about both his experience with elements of our program but also just about the general practice that they're that they're doing and the stewardship work that they're, they're doing so that you can think uh, with us about what's what's possible. Uh, in this space. They're, they're excellent leaders and partners in the farm conservation space, and I'm just so happy and proud to show them off. So let me, uh, let me share my, uh, my screen here. Actually, let me, yes. Share screen and ready for the start. There you go. Um, you should be able to see my slides. And, but however, I need my notes. I think you have to slow shot show slideshow. Yeah. Um, current slideshow. Huh. Um, okay. Well, shoot. <laughs> I'm not able to do both of these things at the same time. One second. Let me just. Go. Try it one more different way. Oops. Well, anyway, I'll I'll try this. Um, so let me um, let me tell you a little bit about our our program, and um, and then I will show you a short little video, and, and we can we can talk more. So River Alliance of Wisconsin. Actually, let me back up one slider because. Uh, I want to show you this great picture that one of our members and a, um, uh, a friend of, of both David's and mine, Adam McKin, took uh, up near Colby, and he um, uh, he won this year's uh, photo contest for River Alliance, and so it's, a, it's just an excellent photo, and I wanted to show it off. Um, River Alliance of Wisconsin is a uh, a non-partisan, uh, statewide, nonprofit. Uh, conservation organization. We have been around for about 25 years and our main mission is to empower people in the state of Wisconsin to protect and restore the state's waters. We, uh, we focus our, our attention on all the state's waters, not just um, not just the, uh, uh, the rivers that are in the, the name of the organization. Um, but we started about 25 years ago with um, a group of motivated uh, Wisconsin citizens who wanted to do um, to do more to protect the water, mainly for their for their recreational interests. So these are people who were who were focused on paddling, fishing, and the like. Since then, we've expanded uh, pretty significantly to do uh, a full slate of of um, of water focused advocacy uh, activities. These include volunteer activities that include uh, that involve people from across the state participating in them, uh, advocacy mobilization of those groups, uh, and some implementation projects. We have eight full-time staff, uh, one part-time staff, and about 2,000 members across the state. And uh, the member number is a little misleading to a certain extent because uh, we, uh, some of those members, are um, lake groups and, and river groups and other uh, smaller conservation organizations that use us as a platform for sharing their work or for activating their own members. So it, it, it really represents quite a, quite a large uh, number of people who, who are, are focused on these issues. Our main areas of expertise in which we have staff that have uh, backgrounds are, are mining, um, dam decommissioning, uh, aquatic invasive species, we have uh, policy staff that are present in the uh, in the capital with the legislature, and uh, more more recently agriculture. And the, the agricultural addition uh, happened because, you know, as you might imagine, uh, um, the water quality and quantity in the state are significantly affected by by agricultural usage. Uh, at the same time, it's an extremely important part of the state's economy. 
uh, and many people have some connection to to agricultural uh, uh, to agricultural land usage in the state. So it it was important for us both from the perspective of our um, our membership, but also because of the, the role that agriculture plays in the, in in water uh, protection in the state, for us to to think seriously about how we could be more engaged with the agricultural community. So a, a number of years ago. Um, uh, Internally, we, just, we talked about this in Matt Kruger, who's now the director of Wisconsin Land and Water, spearheaded this effort at River Alliance. And I've uh, taken over the program in the last year and a half uh, from him as he, as he went on to, to uh, direct that, that other organization. Uh, the main uh, driving mission of the, um, of the Clearwater Farms program, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail, is to engage uh, leaders in the farm conservation space and, uh, and, and to, to help them get the resources and attention that they need um, to help our members and the general public understand the, uh, what agriculture can and cannot and is and is not doing uh, on the water protection front uh, and to try to move the ball forward uh, in that space. So why are we doing this now? Um, well, I mean, if you, if you are at all tuned into uh, water, um, uh, issues in Wisconsin. And one second, let me just grab my, my little sheet here because I have notes on it. I want to get numbers right. Um, so we, we um, uh, there's been a pretty significant uh, and steady worsening of the, particularly the groundwater conditions in the state. And many of you may have seen this, uh, this, this image here on the right. Uh, of the whole state that was um, produced by the Nelson Institute, uh, mapping nitrate in drinking water. Uh, there, are, there are roughly, by, by most estimates, currently about 94,000 wells, uh, like domestic uh, drinking water wells in Wisconsin that are um, beyond the safe level for nitrates, which means that there are probably about 500,000 people in the state that can't safely drink the water in their homes. Uh, and that's pretty shocking given that we're in a place that has abundant water uh, resources, freshwater resources, um, more than most places in the country, more than most places in the world. Uh, despite the fact that there's been a fairly serious effort over the last 10 years to invest uh, in uh, reducing the nitrate and phosphorus loading in, um, in our groundwater and our surface water, that's continued to get uh, progressively worse uh, despite, the, despite a whole bunch of money and effort. And in fact, a, adoption of, of pretty significant changes in the way that agriculture is being done. So we're in this sort of odd situation where we've asked a lot of the farm community. They've given a lot uh, to the project of, of improving um, water quality, although there's lots of distance to go there, but there's been significant effort on that front. And yet the, the, the um, pollution problems that we're facing have gotten steadily worse. And so this is a real challenge. Um, it's something that we have to think in different ways and in new ways about handling. Um, on the right, uh, you can see here, this, this picture is this, uh, the brown and yellow one is the Yahara watershed um, down near kind of where I live in the Southern reaches of that. Uh, and it's, it's um, you can see the big chunks of it. Uh, the water in this, in this area runs off very uh, readily into the ground and into, into the surface waters. And, and this graph on the right here shows you uh, two things. It shows you uh, the blue line is sort of where we would expect phosphorus to go over the last 10, uh, 20 years, 25 years or so, uh, given the management practices that have been adopted and the, uh, over, over the land area. And the red line is what we're actually measuring. And so what we're seeing is that the, the actual loading of phosphorus uh, into the lake systems is higher than the management projects. And, and the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Um, it, it has to do with uh, climate change. Uh, slow, you know, uh, there's, you know the, the pace of adoption is one thing, but we're getting more rain in intense bursts uh, and it's it's causing a lot more runoff than we previously used to have, and in particular, it's happening in the spring. Most of the monitoring uh, we 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 do shows that really almost all of the field runoff uh, into surface waters is happening between January and April. So 
these warmer little bouts we get in the spring here where we get lots of snow in the winter and then they and then we get rapid melts pushes a huge amount of um, of nutrient into uh, into surface waters so um, we I've got another reason why we're, we've been sort of motivated to do this work. I, I came on about a year and a half ago. And one of the first things I did was I went to as many agriculture conferences as I could right away. I went to, I went to as many, um, you know, uh, just anything I could find that was happening uh, that was, was a kind of largish ag conference in the state. And I, what I found was that I was frequently the only person from an environmental organization who was at the, at the conference. Um, and that seemed to me to be a pretty significant problem. And one of the things that suggests to me is that there's a, there's a gap between what conservation organizations are doing and, and what the farm community is up to. And there's just not as much communication in that space as, as there really ought to be if you wanna see, um, if you wanna see change. And, in, and maybe that's a reflection of historical um, lack of cooperation and you know, it's sometimes an adversarial relationship between those communities. Uh, but that's gotta change if, if we wanna make um, a significant difference over time. The Clearwater Farms program is River Alliance's uh, attempt to change this by using our platform of uh, his, and historical advocacy experience to support farmers who are doing standout conservation work, bring them to the front. And so people like, like David, you're gonna hear from tonight, uh, who are really um, kind of leaders in that space. We're trying to make them as visible as possible, trying to support their efforts and talk about them and talk about them to the right sorts of people and, and the groups that we work with. Uh, the goal is to give them credit for the good work they're doing, uh, to help them push their boundaries a little bit by both talking to them about it, but also ensuring that they're in a position where they have to, they're, they're, they're exposing new, uh, new people to new ideas. Uh, and, uh, and, and demonstrate really that, which David does so ably, that, that conservation farming and conservation work is completely um, compatible with pr a profitable farm business. And one of the things I heard when I first started doing this was, you know, it's just not compatible with, you know, there's all these things that we would want people to do, but you just can't be, you know, farming, so the, the financing of farming is so difficult, and it is, um, you just can't do it and do good conservation work at the same time. We don't believe that. And there's lots of evidence that that's not true, but people need to see that and that case needs to be made in a very direct way. So how do we do that? Um, the, um, the Clearwater Farms program, which is uh, River Alliance of Wisconsin's agricultural water stewardship um, program, so kind of sub program, uh, does the following things. We, we lend our, our staff technical capacity and our organizing power uh, to farmers and farmer groups uh, especially um, and increasingly to smaller uh, ag-related conservation groups that don't have significant reach um, or a strong impact as they would like in order to kind of bring those groups to the front uh, and, and empower them. Uh, we provide some concrete measures of achievement uh, for standout leaders in various, at various farm scales. And I'm gonna talk about two of those in a minute. Um, David's farm uh, did the more serious of the two, which is the Alliance for Water Stewardship's international standard. And, uh, but we've also started working uh, uh, with a smaller program we've designed called the Clearwater Farms Commitment that's, that's aimed at, at um, people who don't maybe, you know, farms and, and farm groups that don't have quite the, the technical savvy that, that uh, Milchram Farms does. We, we also provide um, thought leadership and, and and on producer conservation decision making and behavior change through research, which is sort of my specialty, and then partnerships with other groups that are working on that in that space. And then finally, we do some um, policy advocacy directly on agricultural conservation issues and legislation. Um, so, the um, I'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, these first two items here: our, our Alliance for Water Stewardship International Certification and the Clearwater Farms commitment. I'll leave the policy and advocacy uh, uh, aside for now. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but, but, um, but we can, I, want, I intend to focus on the first two. So um, what, uh, what is the uh, Alliance for Water Stewardship International Standard? Well, well real briefly, it, it's, it's an international independent certification created by the Alliance for Water Stewardship that um, was, was intended initially to apply to, uh, to be used for, for manufacturing sites. Uh, it's a very rigorous 
uh, water stewardship certification. If you've ever, I don't know if you've ever heard of like LEED certification for buildings, um, but it's an energy certification that, uh, that applies to construction. So um, it's, it's applied generally to uh, new constructions. And if, you, if the build, building is extremely energy efficient, it gets a you know, st standard gold or platinum seal. The, the Alliance for uh, Water Stewardship International Cer Certification is very much like that, but it just focuses on water stewardship in particular manufacturing or, or uh, industry sites. And it had never been applied to a farm before, uh, even though farms are you know, significant water users. And uh, so uh, David's farm, Miltrum Farms, was the very first farm in North America to achieve this certification. Um, we helped them do that. Uh, we provided some financial assistance and some technical assistance to do it. Um, they did most of the work for it uh, and have it was audited independently and they achieved that very rigorous certification. Um, I wanna show you a, a short little video uh, that we produced about their farm. I'm gonna try to do it through the, through the slideshow here. So um, I, I've got the sound up as high as it goes on my end, so you might, but you might need to control it on, on your end if it's, if it's not audible. So a little three, three minute video we produced uh, with David's farm. Two years ago, River Alliance and Miltrum Farms came together because of our shared understanding that we needed to do something to make sure that we were doing right by our water resources. Water quality and soil health is very important to us. We're a family dairy farm. We're located here in Athens, Wisconsin. I'd say we're definitely a larger farm. We've grown to about 1,800 milking cows. Some of the biggest challenges on the dairy side would be trying to use water in, in its most efficient way. We're in an area that can be deficit in water, groundwater that is. Here our family and all our employees' family live around here too, so we gotta take that resource very seriously. And so Miltrum Farms, they came up with a plan to address those risks putting in place practices that would save water on the farm, putting in place practices that would reduce the amount of polluted runoff that goes into streams, and making sure that they did all of those things in concert with the rest of the community. Through this work that they were doing, Miltrum Farms achieved the Alliance for Water Stewardship's International Water Stewardship Standard. They'll be the first farm in North America to have done that, and we're excited to be a part of it. Having your farm or having your factory certified to the AWS standard can provide several benefits. In a state and in a country where we're gonna see more and more regulations, your farm is going to be beyond regulatory compliance. I think that's really a, an important strategic advantage. And then I think the other benefit is really for, for the stakeholders themselves. The community is assured that they're a good neighbor and that they're treating the water resource fairly and sustainably. And so that's really what we're trying to do here with the Clearwater Farms project. The Clearwater Farms program is our attempt to reshape the agriculture industry. And we're doing it in partnership with farmers across the state to actually give a farm the tools that they're gonna need to not only make money, make a profit in a really tough environment, but to do it by being good stewards of the water resource. I think one of my big hopes is that eventually this certification can be something that's printed on a label saying, hey, this farm is certified. Eventually, maybe companies would be willing to pay a premium for that product. What we want to do now that Milstrom is certified is scale this project up to a watershed level and to make sure that this was something achievable by farms of any size. You know, honestly, I think the most important outcome is, is hopefully we can see change in our watersheds. What makes this special is that we are very deliberately trying to do this in a way that gives every one of our members a farm to root for and a whole group of farms to root for here in Wisconsin. I'm proud of the fact that we are involved in this program for sure and what they represent for our industry. My hopes are that all farms start to take up these practices, take that extra step for water stewardship. We're just excited to continue to improve as a farm and be the best stewards we can be.
So I, I won't. Um, so thanks. I won't dwell too much on the um, on the details of that because I want I want David to get a chance to talk about his experience with it. But I will say that you know this we didn't create the standard. We've just helped uh, farms like David's uh, apply it. One of the reasons that we like it a lot is that it's both extremely rigorous. Um, it sets up a um, a plan. It sets up farms to to work for continuous improvement over time, as opposed to just meeting a condition that they either you know pass or don't pass, but sets up a plan for, for continual improvement over time. And because, and this may be something that um, people don't think about, but it has a very significant element of stakeholder engagement in it. It requires the farm to do lots of outreach efforts. And there's, we see that there's a lot of value in not just sort of quietly getting a certification or quietly achieving this thing and then just kind of marking it or sticking it on a wall or on a field sign, but having to go out and talk about it, having to go out and explain why you did it, um, that we find that to be really important. The, um, so uh, that's one of the things that drew, drew us, I think, to that. And I'll, I'll let David talk about his experience. More recently, we've started um, a, a sort of second, uh, smaller program we're calling the Clearwater Farms Commitment, recognizing that, that there are many farms in the state that are doing some elements of stewardship work, some important elements of stewardship work, but are not, um, at the level of technical um, uh, uh, capacity that that they could um, could achieve the AWS certification independently, so we, we've we've started a kind of smaller program with some of the smaller farms. This is I had to put Jason Cavadini's um, son on here because he's just like unreasonably adorable. Um, so, so, but but the, uh, the idea here is to work with with mostly smaller farmers. Uh, and what we have is a, a commitment document that helps them log their stewardship achievements, um, make some plans. And then we uh, engage in a similar thing like we did with, with David's farm where there's um, storytelling, uh, short, very uh, like much less produced videos, uh, activation of our members and support of the farms that are near them. And then the plan is to build a constituency of farmer uh, advocates across the state that can help us do the kind of uh, activism work that we do. Uh, this includes not only individual farms, but also farm groups like uh, like EPIC, the All Plain Partnership for Integrated Conservation, which is one of the producer-led uh, groups funded by, by DATCAP that we've been uh, involved with, with since, their, since their start. Um, the uh, it's going forward, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's worth reflecting for a minute on wh like why we're doing this again and what, what the mechanism is. Ultimately, when it comes to, to agricultural water stewardship, we're not really confused anymore about what needs to happen in the state. We don't really need to do a whole lot more research to know what the big first steps are. It's more a matter of getting it to happen, more a matter of encouraging adoption and making it possible, um, encouraging people to do the, the basic practices that would make the biggest difference. Um, that includes no-till or at least minimal disturbance uh, uh, of soil, continuous perennial cover, taking land out of production when it doesn't make sense to use it, uh, returning to native plantings, rotational grazing, and we think water stewardship planning is a normal part of a farm business. We're starting to get a pretty clear picture of the costs of this sort of conservation uh, and the benefits of it to farms. And, um, and I think people are starting to see that as, as a motivating force, but we're early yet. And we need, to, we need to do quite a bit of work yet to encourage people to, to pursue this and persist through uh, initial early challenges to uh, conversion to better practice. Um, River Alliance firmly believes that we, all, we need to work on this project, this program, we need to work on this issue from all different angles. We've taken a few different parts of this, but we, you know, we recognize that, there are, that there's more to it than just um, what we can add. What we think needs to happen is we need to identify farmer leaders, uh, standout conservation farmers, and give them our genuine support and some tangible marks and re of recognition. Uh, we need to help them get financing for their projects and find bright pathways to peer influence. They have to influence fellow farmers. People aren't really super excited to talk to me from River Alliance. They want, if they're farmers, they wanna to talk to other farmers who have had that experience and who, who they find convincing um, and, and who can be the front line for, for consulting on what to do. We need um, supporters of conservation itself. So our members, people who are not farmers, but who are interested in conservation to have a stronger understanding of what agricultural business is like 
what the limitations of it are, what it can and can't do, what farmers are and aren't doing right now. Um, people don't have a strong understanding of that. And that has to be paired with um, the farmer leaders coming forward. That people have to meet each other in the middle there. So we're working on both ends of that. Um, meanwhile, pressure has to be put on larger companies that hold key positions in the supply chain and sometimes smaller producers or smaller processors that have a, an important uh, point in a supply chain to, to put pressure on their, on their suppliers and the people they supply uh, to take this stuff seriously. Uh, and the culture around those basic practices has to, has to change. Uh, we also, meanwhile, have to improve um, you know, the, the policy and regulatory environment at the same time and tighten um, the regulatory environment to provide a fair and clear backstop against the worst possible outcomes. So that the people who are really doing a good job um, don't, uh, don't stumble over that. But ultimately relationships here are the first and foremost most important thing. Uh, and, and I think that's been the thing that's I think the most, most impressive and interesting and for, for me working with a farm like David's. Um, he and I probably don't agree on absolutely everything. And our perspectives are, you know, are just different. That's okay, that's perfectly okay. I respect him deeply. And I think the work that he does is, is very important um, because I know how seriously he takes it. <laughs> You know, and I and I see the creativity there and the effort there. Uh, I think he's doing a huge service to Wisconsin generally and the Wisconsin ag uh, agricultural community by speaking as much as he does uh, about this stuff. He's out there, the special last few weeks, he's been on Zoom pretty much continuously. Um, and my ideal is that people like David can go back, uh, you know, ultimately, I want the, what I want for him is to him to go back to his just managing his herd and not having to do this. I want it to be so commonplace that people are doing what Miltrum is doing or thinking about this the way that Miltrum is thinking about it, that um, you, could get an, you could get the same story from any farm that you went to. <laughs> you know, you, you, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a unique and weird thing that we have to, have to find these standout people. Um, uh, this would be good for everybody. This would be good for the farm economy. It would be good for the environment. Um, so, and I'll, I'll stop there so that David has, has plenty of time to talk to you about his, his experience. Uh, but if you are interested in more, please contact me and um, I'm happy to answer questions after David uh, talks a little bit. Alrighty, well, I, I guess I can get started right away. Um, thanks, Mike, for the, the kind words at the end there. I appreciate that. And it's been great to work with Mike and uh, uh, the River Alliance. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, just a lot of good things coming out of all this. So I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get started. So I'm gonna kind of talk to you guys about uh, what our, our commitment is to conservation, what that looks like. So we'll start off a little bit with um, uh, kind of the farm background. So again, this is a family farm. It was established in 1988 by my dad and my uncle, that'd be Scott Trimner and Tom Miller. And at the time um, it was a, a pretty small farm and, and you know, conservation has been a, a long held family practice. Uh, my grandpa, which would be Tom's dad, he uh, has won some conservation awards for uh, strip contouring, is what I was told, and uh, a few other things. And um, so it's just something that uh, has been uh, in the family for a long time now. Uh, currently, uh, we now milk 2,800 cows. 1,100 of those are in our robots, and then the other 1,700 are in our traditional parlor. And then with that, obviously, you have to feed the animals. We crop about 5,000 acres, and so that's split between corn, used for corn silage and grain, uh, kind of an alfalfa grasses mix, and then a little bit of oats that we like to throw in there as well. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit what got us started. Um, so again, water is pretty important to our families. Um, I just remember as a kid going up to Phillips, where my cousins lived, to go out on the lake there. Uh, my, my Uncle Tom, he loves fly fishing. Um, there's a lot... There's a lot of just uh, cool, cool areas in Wisconsin and particularly central Wisconsin that have, uh, you know, a, a good things to, to do with water. And, and then we just have a lot of our families that, that live here and drink the water. And so that's obviously very important. Um, you know, one thing too, that's also really important to us here is we have a lot of wildlife and uh, whether that's deer hunting or uh, 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 bird hunting and whatnot, uh, there's a lot of those different things that people like to enjoy or just bird watching and those kind of things. So we want to, you know, we want to have a, a keep the environment 
positive for those animals. Um, you know, obviously, as Mike talked a little bit, surface runoff, uh, as well as, as nitrate um, issues, but surface runoff is a big issue, particularly in, in um, our county. Um, we have a lot of fields with a high risk of erosion, and uh, partly because there's, there's a lot of slope. Um, and then the other thing is we have a, a, one of the highest percentage of acres that are corn silage. And so uh, corn silage, when you, when you do it right, uh, you can protect the soil with other crops that I'll talk about. But if you just uh, uh, put down corn silage and harvest it, the soil is pretty bare and it's unprotected. And in our area particularly, we have very heavy soils. And so if, we, if I don't uh, implement some of these practices, that soil gets hard and the water just runs right off. And uh, with that, you're, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have runoff and, and bad things happening with that. So, um, so it, obviously, I want to talk a little bit about the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Um, you know, obviously, we've, uh, like I said, water is important to us and and how we do this. But uh, the Alliance for Water Stewardship was uh, really important to be really important to us because we we felt that it was a great way for us to really take uh, these passions that we have. And, and put some direction and focus towards them and, and also keep us accountable. Um, it's something uh, that we have, it's a third party audit that we do eight, every 18 months. Um, it uh, is, is nothing over the top, it's particularly the, the, uh, the, the audit uh, after you get initially um, uh, get the, uh, uh, the certification, but um, uh, getting the original certification, there was a lot of groundwork into that. And one thing, the reason why that was is because of us being the first farm, we had to kind of, um, you know, work with um, the Alliance for Water Stewardship and whatnot and, uh, and set up how that looked and what, what was the path uh, that other farms could take. You know, we had to set the groundwork. So a um, lot of uh, long forms to fill out and, and, and kind of um, spreadsheets to make in order to say, hey, who are our stakeholders? Who, um, what are our goals? How do we achieve those goals? And so we went through a lot, but it was worth it because our goal is to is to hopefully make this much easier for the next farm and then the next farm and continue on so that uh, becoming certified is is not something that looks like a huge hurdle, especially when you're a farm who already does a lot of great things and has a good plan in place. Um, and again, as Mike talked about, you know, the certification focuses on making improved changes. And so as a farm, it's not like you got to start out as a rock star. As long as you, you're starting out, you're, you're doing the right things already. You know, you're in compliance, uh, particularly if you're a larger farm, you have your, you know, your, your, your CAFO regulation. If you're, you're being in compliance, if you're a small farm, just, you know, doing those right things. Um, and some things you may not uh, realize um, uh, could be hurting the soil or, or, or causing excess runoff, but it's not like you got to start out perfect. Uh, the goal of the, of the program, again, is to is to work up and continue to get better. And even for us now, we've been doing this for uh, six years. And um, because of that, we uh, will just have to continue to uh, get better and better and, and improve on our practices. So some practices that we do focus on, uh, doing as much no-till and minimum till as possible. Uh, we also focus on utilizing cover crops to have growth year round. Uh, we find that that's uh, very important for improved soil health. Uh, incorporating water savings practices on the farm, uh, a little bit of uh, responsible and productive manure use and handling. One thing a, a, as a dairy farm, obviously we've got many gallons of manure and we try to shift our focus from manure being a waste to manure being a fertilizer and treating that as such. Uh, one is a good thing uh, that it, it is fertilizing the soil and uh, uh, building up the plants and whatnot, but also that uh, uh, excess fertilizer is a bad thing and we don't want it to leave the, the field. And then the last uh, practice that we focus on is removing unproductive land to create buffers and plots. So we'll kind of uh, go through each one and, and talk a little bit more details about what those look like here. So the no-till practices. So uh, basically um, what that means is just uh, not, not doing tillage, not breaking up that soil, um, leaving the soil undisturbed. Um, the only uh, tillage we do if we absolutely have to is, is leveling big ruts on like our corn ground and generally uh, that doesn't have to have to be the case anymore. Uh, 2019 was one year where it was so terribly wet that uh, uh, you're going to make a few ruts but uh, because we had uh, the cover crops and the no-till that really helped um, that really helped with uh, 
uh, being in the fields. And, and I'll discuss that in a bit here. But uh, one thing we did, we purchased a no-till capable corn planter. So there are some upgrades that we had to make, but they were well worth it. And by doing that, we were able to get in the field quicker because you don't have to do your tillage and work the ground. Um, and then we, we still do some minimal tillage on new hay ground, but we're continuing to kind of improve our practices and, and uh, eventually want to get away from it completely and um, get the necessary equipment to do that, but then also uh, uh, just get better at it and, and do what we need to do. Um, one thing that's really awesome about no-till no -till is the fact that the fields are, are significantly firmer. And it's, it's really something that's, that's kind of interesting, especially for us, we have very heavy soils. So uh, they get saturated and then they get mushy. When you, don't, when you do no-till practices, what you're doing is you're, you're helping the soil maintain its natural structure. And when you till it, there, there's no structure. It's, it's basically powder. So once it gets wet, it just turns into mush. And by doing or by not doing tillage, you could say, we uh, allow the fields to be firmer, which um, is, a big, is a big deal. When you can get into your fields in the spring that much earlier, uh, it's going to be really important to being productive on a farm. And then the other really important thing, of course, is the soil is, is uh, staying in place. So when you don't disturb that, the, the soil kind of has a natural armor combined with the cover crops. And because of that, you, you're going to have less runoff. You're going to have less um, damage from rain because, you know, raindrops do uh, erode the soil. And when you have that uh, kind of that strength to it and that, um, that soil structure, uh, that really protects that. And that's really important. However, one thing is, is no-till is not uh, an end-all practice. We really feel that you need to combine that with with cover crops, and uh, here's kind of why. So one thing we started, you know, like I said, we started no till and cover crops about six years ago, just doing some experimentation. Um, we we started with uh, drilling ryegrass uh, uh, after we uh, harvested our corn silage, and um, over time we started planting different corn silages that uh, better help the cows, and so we had to kind of switch how we did it because those those silages harvested. Uh, later and so we didn't have enough time to plant these cover crops so what we did is we bought an air seeder and that's what you see in the picture on the right and basically what it does is it allows us to plant cover crops in between the corn rows and uh, so the really cool thing about that is it's it offers a lot of flexibility on when you can seed and so what we're doing now what we've learned is that uh, the earlier is the, uh, the the earlier you can do it the better so right now you plant your corn and then um just after the corn's kind of popped out of the ground, even shorter than what you see in the picture, we're going in there with this uh, air seeder and we're planting a bunch of different types of species of cover crops in there. And what that allows it to do is, um, is the uh, cover crops are going to be able to uh, germinate and, and get, get themselves established. And then after you know a, a short period of time, the corn's gonna get tall enough where it'll canopy. So now the corn's getting all the energy, which is what you want. Obviously you want your, your corn to be uh, big and tall and strong. So you get lots of yield out of it and can feed your cows. Uh, but the cover crops just goes dormant for the time being. And once you harvest, uh, if you gave it adequate time, now you got a really a solid establishment. And uh, we'll go on to the next slide here and you'll kind of see, you know, this is what uh, a pretty solid cover crop looks like on your uh, picture in the right. And um, that's what we like to see and actually even thicker than that eventually as we continue to, to kind of learn about the different species that we use as well as the different rates that we seed them. Um, that's really important to uh, making a really successful cover crop. So another thing that's really cool about, about the uh, cover crop is the fact that it, it also creates kind of a strong mat for equipment to drive on. So it again helps that, that idea of um, uh, keeping fields firm and again, when you, when you have a wet spring or just a wet year like 2019, that really makes a big difference. And it's, it's really a cool, cool thing to see. And it's, again, it's one of those benefits um, that you maybe didn't realize. As kind of Mike talked about before, these practices are definitely worthwhile. The cost is worthwhile to um, plant the seed and, and do these things. Um, we, we would not go away from this, even if for some reason, you know, there was, there was not these other, you know, conservation benefits because the, the benefits that you get from it, it just, it starts to become a no brainer. Um, there's, there's other challenges that may be small farms that have to get over like the equipment wise, but I, I, I fully believe that uh, when farmers come together, you can um, make things 
possible. So uh, what you see here on the screen is just a, a bunch of different types of species that we use. And so all the species that we pick are generally for different purposes. And so you can see the top one, the cereal rye and the annual rye. Those ones are really great at alleviating compaction. And so basically compaction is just a really hard layer of soil. It generally happens when you drive equipment on a field that's a little too wet. And what that does is, is um, it allows most plant matter to, to, to not allow the roots to get deep enough. But cereal rye and annual rye are, are very different because uh, those plants, they will just burrow through right, right through that and break that up. And that allows to, again, create really awesome soil structure and with that soil structure, now you're getting, you're getting good water infiltration. And because of that, uh, water's going into the soil and not running off the soil. Um, a few other ones, uh, uh, you, you got the spring green uh, that you see on there. So basically meaning that these are, um, these are gonna come back green in the spring, which is what we want to see because we want uh, to have growing plant matter uh, all year round. Obviously in winter, things don't technically grow, but uh, they're still alive. And so we like to have that because uh, the spring and the fall are, are really sensitive times, particularly the spring in Wisconsin, because you have all the snow melt. And so we want things on there that are gonna protect it. Um, we've got uh, a lot of these clovers in there that uh, do something called nitrogen fixation, which is just basically they take nitrogen that's not usable by most plants out of the air and then turn it into a form that they use. And uh, a big perk of that is um, it, it'll help reduce some of your fertilizer needs. And that's really important to um, reducing what you need, uh, reducing costs, but then also having to reduce the amount of fertilizer that you put on the field. Um, and then we, you see uh, the white clover is good for handling wetter spots. So uh, you're always gonna have some low parts in the field and uh, ha having certain types of species that really handle those areas is great to have. And you can see I, I have in their biomass. So basically we just want lots of green, lots of plant matter, and uh, something like red clover is gonna provide that. And another interesting thing um, is uh, the, the cover crop that you see uh, in this picture, but particularly in this one here, the, the plants with the really big leaves. So what that is, is that's actually rapeseed. And one interesting thing about that is a reason why we plant it is, is it actually helps um, with pests. Uh, not, not all of them, but a, a, a good, good part of them will feed on the rapeseed that's low to the ground and then be satisfied and then they won't feed on the corn. And what that does is uh, prevent use of, of pesticides because you've just kind of, kind of got a natural barrier there. Um, another one, uh, the hairy vetch, it grows uh, long and tall and is you know, biannual. Again, it fixates that nitrogen. And then cow peas is just another, another good one. One thing we, we, we kind of strive for and the reason why we like to use a bunch of different species is because one thing we've learned um, over the years, just as, as, as people and humans kind of have a gut microbiome, there's, there's a soil microbiome. So the microbes are working, they're, they're doing a lot more things than we ever thought. And one of those things is making different um, nutrients available to the plants that are, that are trying to grow. And so having a lot of different species of plants kind of helps create a, a vast microbiome, and uh, which is pretty important. Uh, one thing that I, I don't have in the slides here, but I'll tell you guys about, um, for our haylage, we used to plant uh, strictly alfalfa. And then in 2019, we lost all of it. So now we plant uh, a mixture of alfalfa and some grasses. And now this next year, we're actually going to add some clovers in there as well. And so this is going to be a forage that's harvested for feed for the cows, which I'm pretty excited for because I think having more species, uh, one, it diversifies your, your risk, you know, uh, species survive different things. And, and again, with climate change and making things a little more intense as we continue to go on, um, that's only helpful. But I, I think um, having that uh, different species will help the microbiome in the soil and then also help the microbiome in the cow to just have a healthier cow. So that's kind of a, a little interesting fact as well. So uh, I'll just kind of recap a little bit, but uh, again, some of the benefits for the farm, uh, aside from just you know being good stewards is uh, it removes the cost of multiple passes to the field. So pulling a our biggest tractor with a chisel plow through a field is a pretty expensive thing to do. So by eliminating almost all that work, uh, that's a big uh, cost savings for a farm. Again, I talked about that soil structure. Uh, it it uh, helps water to permeate the soil and also helps hold on to water. 
Um, so for, for places such as in the central sands of Wisconsin, this I think is where it's gonna be really important to uh, one, hold on to water so that uh, they just have it available for their, their plants, but also hold on to nitrogen and uh, not allow those nitrates to permeate all the way through and then start to contaminate uh, groundwater. Again, it, I talked about those soil micro, microbiome and how important that is, uh, even though we can't really see it. Uh, again, long-term, it'll improve organic matter. And now we're talking decades here, but uh, you know what? You gotta be in it for the long haul. So let's hope we can start to see some uh, organic matter improvements over the next uh, a few generations. And then again, I talked about that firmer fields. Uh, it, it, that's really one for, uh, for farms. It's, it's a little hard to, to tell farmers what that value is in dollars, but uh, there really is a lot of value for that. And I think it's, it's useful. And I, I gave a talk um, a few weeks ago on profitability with all this. And that was one thing I really stressed is, is being able to get into your fields earlier, planting your, your crops earlier gives you that much more yield and that much more uh, uh, profit. So the next one, obviously uh, water, water is a, a big deal. Um, cows, they drink a lot of water. And so we try to do everything we can on the farm to help lower our water use. And uh, through that, we like to use good, good technologies. So one thing we have, we, um, and the row barn particular, we, we actually flush the alleys with what we call gray water. It's just, it's just a recycled uh, manure water. And we use things like a centrifuge to help keep that, that flush clean. So by doing that, you continue to use the recycled water. You're not, you're not adding in a bunch of fresh water to do that to keep that clean. Um, another thing we use is good ventilation. And you might think, well, what does ventilation have to do with water? So uh, in the new facility, because there's uh, enough ventilation to keep the cows cool, we've learned now uh, over have, having gone through a summer that we will not need water to cool the cows, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, we, we thought we would have to do that, but uh, it seems like the cows uh, this last summer, which was moderately hot, uh, it, it didn't seem to, to affect the cows too much. So uh, by utilizing good ventilation, um, we don't have to use water to cool them. Uh, when it comes to waters, one thing we, we try to do is uh, make sure that they're, they're pretty shallow. Um, and by doing that, uh, obviously you, wanna, you want the cows to always have good clean water to drink. So you need to clean those. And so when you do that, if you keep it shallow, that's less water that you're wasting as you dump that out. Um, another cool thing that we didn't expect to, to, uh, to see, but we kind of learned more about it, is, is the robots actually use less water than a traditional parlor. Um, each robot uses about 125 gallons of water per day. Um, and uh, when it comes to a traditional parlor, you've got big fire hoses uh, washing down, you know, keep cleaning up that parlor, which you want, you want to do. But uh, by, kind of, uh, by kind of shrinking the parlor and making it a smaller space to clean, even though there's more of them, you're saving water, you're using, you're using smaller hoses and less capacity to do that job. And then uh, another thing, in our older facility, we'd still use some water for uh, uh, cooling the cows, but we switched, we switched all of our nozzles over to much more efficient water nozzles so we can, we can better target that water and how we cool the cows because we, we want them to be comfortable and we want them to be healthy. Um, and so in certain instances, you still want to use that but uh, it's kind of targeting. It's kind of like using flood irrigation versus drip irrigation out in a field, uh, targeting how you use that water, uh, the timing of it and, and the volume is really important. So again, another thing that's uh, everyone always, uh, you know, you have to think about as, as a farm with animals is, is how you handle your manure. And um, one thing that we, we did is we switched to, uh, and this was a while ago, we switched to a, a, a special uh, injection uh, manure handling equipment that that just makes a little little crack in the in the in the soil uh, to inject the manure in. And one reason why we inject the manure, uh, particularly in the fall, is because it allows it to um, it allows it to get the manure in the ground so it doesn't go anywhere. But it only does just enough to to get that there, uh, versus doing a lot of disturbance or doing doing the plowing that we don't want to do. And so that's really important. Um, uh, utilizing that technology. And then another thing that we do is we, a lot of the manure, we, we um, use a, what's called a drag hose. And so basically instead of um, hauling all of your manure on trucks and uh, taking that down the road, uh, everything that's within you know five miles or so of the farm, you can haul directly from a hose. And so basically you got a hose in the manure pit and it just runs through this hosing 
and goes right to the field that you need it. And then the far away uh, fields where we do have to still haul with trucks, uh, we'll, we'll dump into a, um, what we call a frack tank. So it's just a big dumpster. Uh, and we'll feed the tractor with the hose right off of that. And what that does is it allows for less compaction in the fields and better health and, and uh, uh, make that work better. And then another thing that I, I don't have a picture of, but I'll, I'll try to describe as best I can. Uh, be, because of the new mixes that I've described to you guys about our with our hay ground, we can now put a little bit of manure on that. And one thing is uh, that we use for that is called a dribble bar. And so this, instead of um, top dressing like you would conventionally see, which kind of, if you see, imagine a tanker and it's spraying out the back and spraying in the air, that really atomizes the manure. So it smells and uh, you're going to lose some, some of your nutrients just to uh, particular nitrogen, just to gassing off and whatnot. By using a dribble bar, this, um, it, it doesn't till the ground at all. It just uh, drops it right on the soil. And so by doing that, you don't atomize the manure. Uh, the, the odor is, is not there. And actually, uh, we've had uh, neighbors uh, say they didn't even realize that we spread manure on our hay fields because it, it just does such a good job. And then the last thing, which I think is, is really important, is we try to spread at, at, at what's technically pretty low rates. And so for the corn ground, we shoot for 10,000 gallons uh, an acre. And then for the hay grounds, we shoot for about 7,000. And so uh, again, that's two, two, two important parts to that. One is uh, if you overdo the manure, um, there's just high risk of runoff. And obviously you don't want that. But then the other thing, again, is going back to that soil microbiome. Putting uh, too much manure on there is gonna really kind of knock down that microbiome, really destroy those microbes. And uh, that's not what we want. Again, we want those microbes to be there. So when we put the manure down, they're breaking down those nutrients. The plant matter is being able to take, take those nutrients up quickly and efficiently. And so by uh, lowering the rates, uh, that's a pretty key to being able to do that. So last but not least, we, um, another thing that we're trying to do is utilize technology, um, particularly field maps and yield monitors to, to kind of sort out our poor land. And so what that looks like is um, imagine you've got, uh, I, uh, we just, I just did a presentation on this one. Imagine I, you have a 65 acre field and the bottom edge of it just never, it never does well. You know, no matter what you do, that bottom edge is, is wet. It, it never produces a great crop. And so year over year, you're actually maybe losing money on that little bit of area. And so what we've uh, have been experimenting with is actually putting in buffer strips um, in those areas um, to, to kind of take that out of conventional production. And so we, like, we, we did do that this year with some ground and it was, it paid off. We, um, uh, on this field, particularly it was 62 acres and about eight of those acres we planted in, in just a grassy mix. Um, and because of that, we're still able to harvest some of that grass for our, uh, our heifers, but, uh, the average yield for that whole, that whole field, um, was, was better and the um, average profitability was better, which is important. But the other, the other, the other perk of that buffer strip is the fact that um, you ha you have now kind of a, a again a buffer in that area where where it is most sensitive, the area where generally it's going to be wetter all the time and whatnot. So now, if you ever do have heavy rains or just something something you know uh, crazy, I guess you could say you've got that strip that the water can flow through. It can capture any excess nutrients that might be there, uh, stop any soil erosion. And so it just offers protection for that field and prevents it from going um, off the field, basically. Uh, kind of like uh, its own special little ditch, you could say, but it's, it's still on field. And then another thing that we're doing, um, when it goes kind of to the next level, you could say, if you've got a whole field that's really not productive, and generally they're 10 acres or 15 acre fields, um, and what we've done already now actually is, is taken some of these fields completely out of production and put them into things like CRP or put them into Monarch or honeybee plots. And uh, by doing this, we get rid of land that is just not productive to us anymore and then uh, put it back into nature. And by doing that, uh, I think uh, we're benefiting, um, depending on the focus, again, we're benefiting the, the uh, insects or the honeybees or whatever in the area. and um, kind of creating uh, a natural ground again and turning it back into what it probably should have been. So um, another thing that we're looking into and hoping to do potentially this year 
is actually put in some more of these plots near the farm, near where our wells are at, because obviously we have uh, uh, a big farm with lots of roof space and lot, you know some blacked up here and there and just uh, um, other driveways where water, uh, you know, it's clean, it runs off and it goes through our, our uh, um, through our outlets and, and just back into, you know, the low lying areas. Well, what if we can, what if we can uh, put in these special um, uh, uh, plots to help capture that water and hold it, hold it there so it can infiltrate and then recharge our wells. I think that's really important because where we're at particularly, we have lots of water that's, that's, you know, it's pretty close to the, the uh, surface. It's, it's definitely not deep, but we, we don't, by all means, we don't have this huge aquifer like uh, other states and other areas have. And so we want to be the best stewards of that water resource that we do have. And so we're pretty excited about being able to, uh, you know, take this, you know, couple acres of, of water that just uh, has to run somewhere and go somewhere and be able to capture it and uh, hold on to it and, and utilize it in our wells and, and in our system. So it's kind of just that whole cycle. So it's uh, uh, pr pretty uh, pretty interesting, and we're excited to be able to try that out. So just uh, again, some closing things. Um, by all means, conservation brings a lot of value to the dairy. Uh, it's it's not just uh, it's not just uh, you know kind of a fluffy thing that makes you feel good. Even though it it definitely uh, uh, makes us feel good as a team to know that we're we're doing right by um, uh, by our land and water. Um, it again improves the soil health. Uh, it helps better capture those manure nutrients when you have when you have green plants growing there. Um, that's really important to to uh, help help capture that manure and and keep that in place and make it more usable for next year. Again, I talked about how it's easier for us to get into fields. Um, another thing that I did not mention, uh, we have not seen any yield loss from planting these cover crops. Um, when you do it, uh, 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 when you kind of when you do it in the right way. Uh, they just provide benefit. They don't uh, they don't slow the corn down. It doesn't uh, hurt anything in that regard, uh, which is a big deal. And so that's really exciting to see. So we want to just continue to improve on that and and get our cover crops better and better each year. And then I think finally, uh, uh, we're just uh, we're trying to promote productive soils and, and clean water for generations. Um, one thing that I had uh, heard recently on uh, I think it was a I was a documentary called I think it was called Kiss the Soil or Kiss the Ground, and um, they talked about that if if we continue to do our traditional practice as we do now, we could potentially have have no topsoil left in sixty years, and sixty years sounds like a long time, but you can say you know that's sixty harvests, and that's not that much, and so we don't want to be in that place. We want to have uh, healthy, productive soils for. Uh, many generations to come. And so by uh, doing these things and continuing to improving on these practices, because there's there's many things we can uh, continue to learn yet. I, I think these are important to making that happen. So uh, with that, uh, we could take any questions. Thank you, uh, David. And we uh, and appreciated your presentation. and. And most of all, I think we appreciated your enthusiasm and your obvious uh, passion for what you're doing. This is fantastic. Um, there are some questions that are in the, in the chat already and uh, don't hesitate to, if you have one uh, to continue to uh, put them in there. Uh, Catherine asks, how are you spreading the word to farmers across the state about the pros of food conservation farming practices? Uh, great question. So, uh, well, one thing we're part of our, our EPIC group we call, um, and through that, we're uh, uh, reaching out to other farmers and kind of telling them about what we're doing. Our EPIC group is the, uh, is the kind of the Old Plain Watershed group. And so one thing for us that uh, focuses on our watershed, because you got to start small and uh, uh, start from there and, and, and hope to uh, make our watershed better and then spread throughout uh, the state. And then I guess another thing is doing things like this. Um, there, there have been a lot of great avenues, um, different organizations that have, have asked uh, us to speak. And so by doing these kinds of things, um, it, it's kind of helped get the word out there. And, and um, uh, another uh, kind of encouraging thing, in just two weeks, we have an event called uh, the PDPW Business Conference, which is uh, it's a Wisconsin organization that's for, um, focused on farmers. And there'll probably be eight, 800 farmers or so there um, in the Dallas in a big area. But um, 
a lot, some of the focuses on the talks this year are, are on these kinds of things. So uh, it's becoming more and more on the forefront. And I think it's, I'm hoping it'll, it'll really start to take off in the coming years. Terrific. Um, uh, I think a corollary to that would be, uh, most of us, I'm gonna guess on this call are not uh, farmers. And so we're in a, in a whole different space and we have something different to bring to it. And I'm curious about uh, whether number one, uh, uh, is the product that you sell going to a, a dairy who is uh, trumpeting the fact that the product is, is raised in this, uh, this manner? Um, or are there, is there things that we as consumers can be looking for or should be looking for uh, to make this uh, movement happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, right now, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a ton of a focus right on the consumer end, on the label end kind of thing right now about um, particularly the land conservation. I know there's, you know, more and more push when it comes to um, uh, carbon footprint in that manner, uh, which, which makes a difference because one thing I didn't focus on at all, but um, a lot of these practices are also really crucial to sequestering carbon and uh, utilizing agriculture to hopefully help do a large mitigation of global warming. But um, otherwise, uh, honestly, not a whole lot right now. Um, I think there's the big focus on that. And, and for now, we'll, we'll just keep pushing out the, the good word and hope that uh, um, people, uh, more people get, you know, hear about it, so. I, I was gonna add to that, that, like, that I think, you know, um, there's a lot of, there's always a lot of focus on the sort of consumer and you know labeling or buying something at the store because it's an easy story to tell and easy to understand. But the reality is like a lot of the like anywhere you look in the world where there's conversion of behavior at, at the farm scale, almost all of the motivation comes from a much smaller scale. It, it's it's um, farmers adopt stuff because it works for them and because the people around them do it and because it makes sense for them financially. Um, there are very few actual instances of con like completely consumer driven change at the, at the farm scale, historically. Organic is maybe an example of that, but even that had a tremendous amount of help to make that happen. So, so what can you do? It's a version of what you're doing right now, which is it, it, the better understanding you have of what they are actually, what farmers are actually doing, what they, what this, what it means to be a good, conservation farm um, more than just sort of you know like having a good understanding of the sorts of things that, that David's talking about and then being able to talk to the farmers and have a relationship with the farmers in your plate in, in your space that's that's a big deal and it's almost you know that that's almost more those relationships are almost more influential than any sort of consumer driven thing we hope that over the long term that that happens but in the short term it's 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 knowledge and and relationships that's a great point, Mike. And another thing I want to add quick to that, that I, I had heard um, a couple months ago now, but I thought was really interesting was um, I had heard that there's the, the really large companies like, like Nestle and those companies. Um, I, I'd mentioned, you know, that in, in potentially 60 years, we could have no topsoil. Well, these, these con companies are starting to look at paying their suppliers more by doing these practices because they're afraid they will have no product to buy. They're, they're, they're not even thinking like, what does the consumer want? They're thinking, am I going to have some, am I going to have food to buy to then sell to my consumers in 60 years? And that's a big deal because if, if that's your whole business is, is selling food and now we don't have, we can't grow it, uh, that's, that's a disaster. So I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, David's totally right about that. And I think, I think that the, one of the things that's important about for the farmers to understand here too, is that they're, they're being, um, progressive about this really helps them out because the what what sometimes happens in these cases is not that like a general mills will say hey we'll pay you more for this they'll just say do it or we won't buy it anymore right yeah. and, yeah. and if, if you get into that situation then you're in real trouble right so you you the, the more you can get ahead of that the better and that is what actually what we see when we see big changes mcdonald's says we're not doing cage-free eggs anymore it wasn't because they had you know they, there was some like <laughs> clear thing that McDonald's figured out about that. They just made a decision about it and overnight the, the industry had to change and respond to it. it and, and it was difficult for those farmers to do it, but now because they're a major purchaser, that's what happened. 
General Mills is, hasn't done that yet, but the, but it, there's a day where they could just say, we're just not going to buy from you anymore. <laughs> unless you, unless mm -hmm. you do it, you have five years, get, get with it. Um, yeah. And then you're not already doing it, the costs are going to be extremely high for conversion. Okay. Um, another question is about the cost. How much uh, of an upfront financial barrier is there to farms to implement the practices? Can you estimate a payback time? Yeah, good question. So, um, when it comes to cost, I want to say really the biggest cost you're going to have is um, is particularly the cedar itself. So with our with our air cedar, um, that was uh, something that obviously we had to purchase in order to be able to do this. And then I guess another thing again would be a no-till planter because not all planters are capable of uh, uh, planting in a ground that's firm like a no-till. So, I mean that can vary. Um, uh, with a large, a large firm like us, you know, it's a, a $200,000 piece of equipment. Um, and when it comes to small farms, something I, I, I've thought about it is, um, is the, the fact that, you know, I think a lot of us are all good neighbors to each other. And so whether it's maybe you've got a group of four or five small farms that either band together and, hey, let's get a planter and let's get a cedar that can do this work and we'll share it and, or you've got a, a large farm neighbor and you've got a great relationship with them. And you say, Hey, can you, can you do this for me? Can you, you know, I'll, I'll pay you a certain amount. It'll help pay for your piece of equipment. And it'll allow me to not have to try to buy this piece that I just can't afford. So I really do think there's ways to, to um, get everyone involved, but we, we do have to be creative. So I know even for us with our air seeder, we've, uh, done some air seeding for local farms and one wasn't even small, but they just needed to, they needed to, to get their feet wet. And rather than going buying this, we just did that for them. And, and uh, it was kind of, you know, it's a win-win. So. Interesting. Um, Bill Barkley says that kiss the ground is the name of the yes. that you referenced. And he said, it's a must read. I don't know mm -hmm. who wrote it, but uh, that was a. It's also on Netflix as a, as a, um, oh, it's a, as a yeah, so it's, it was very good. Yeah, I recommend watching it too. Okay, another uh, question. Thanks for a great talk. How much? How many acres do you spread manure on? And have you had any nitrate issues with uh, groundwater? So that's a great question. Uh, when it comes to nitrate, no, we have not. Uh, one thing, we have very heavy soils. So I think that helps. And then also now with our reduced rates. But um, so... Each year we're going to spread, well, actually now we're spread on almost, almost every acre. It used to be um, when we had strictly alfalfa, we'd only spread on the corn ground. So you're talking about half. Now, every year we're spreading some manure on each acre, which uh, we think is very important because we need to spread that manure on more acres. We need to, you know, uh, sp spread that out because it, you, no longer the days where we can spread uh, 25,000 gallons on the, on the back 40, cause it was close, you know, I mean, that's the things that are, are, uh, you know, just, just, uh, not, not good anymore. So, yeah. So basically almost all 5,000, um, we'll try to get every year, some, some manure on spread that out through all the acres. So. Uh, what are your thoughts about, uh, rotational grazing? That's another good question. So one thing I like to, uh, really, drive home is that I love to see farms of all sizes. We've got uh, quite a few smaller farms. Well, obviously Wisconsin has many smaller farms, but in my area, uh, lots of smaller farms, some guys putting in two or four robots to milk 120, 200 cows. Um, and I love, I think rotational grazing is, uh, is a great thing. And that, and there's, there's plenty of land that that's what it's, that's what it's best used for is to graze cattle and to uh, use it in that manner. And I also think it's a key part of, of the whole the whole picture, I guess you could say. And so generally what I asked uh, all farmers is that we, we work together versus uh, you know con condemning one versus the other. I think uh, everyone likes to do things a different way. And so if you're a 200 cow dairy that grazes your herd, I say that's awesome. And I think you should continue to, to do that to the best of your ability, so. Okay. Um... That's the last uh, question that's in the chat, I believe. I, I haven't missed one. Um, someone says, kiss the ground, and Josh Tickle must be the name of the producer or the person that did it. Um, I guess, if unless there are any other questions, um, I'm going to uh, move on. Does anybody in the, in the group that's here have, still have a question they'd like to pose? 
uh, while we have a few minutes. If not, I know that uh, our speakers want to get on their way. So let me begin to, uh, to wind down by thanking uh, everybody. Uh, thanks especially to the presenters, uh, Michael and David. Um, appreciate again very much the fact that you're spending time with us. We now realize how much time you're spending with everybody else. So um, we value it uh, even more highly. Um, Jadine uh, uh, for her support from the Sierra Club. Uh, Karen Triver for uh, sharing hosting duties tonight. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Jeff Henry, who I don't know, I don't think he made it tonight, but uh, Jeff Henry was the producer of the program tonight and uh, program last week, as, or last uh, month as well. Uh, Jeff's been producing our programs for the last uh, couple of years and has done a, a terrific job. And so we really thank him for the amount of work. It is a lot more work than you would ever imagine um, producing a program like this. So, and then finally, uh, just a reminder, the recording will be available in the next day or so at the Sierra Club Facebook page. We will notify you uh, as soon as we can as to how to get a hold of that. There's some other documents that we'll send your way as well. And um, uh, that's pretty much what I've got, uh, unless Karen has anything to throw out. Uh, and I, oh, I was gonna mention the action groups, the water, the Sierra Club, I think we mentioned them earlier, but if you have questions, Jadine put on the chat that uh, you're welcome to contact her. The Sierra Club has this system of, or this uh, organizing tool called action groups, and there is a water team. Um, the water team meets and uh, strategizes on how to make the waters of Wisconsin uh, better and more uh, um, for all of us, whatever the word is, I don't even know. Um, but um, contact her if you're interested in uh, knowing more about that. Uh, or go to the Facebook or the Sierra Club website, and I, I think you can find information there about it as well. So finally, I'll just say be well. Uh, keep enjoying, uh, exploring, and protecting the planet. Thank you, and uh, good night, everyone.